All right, we're here with Matt Wyatt. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for joining us today, man. I know uh, it takes a lot to take, take time out of your schedule and join us, so we can't uh, thank you enough for that. Yeah, glad to, glad to. Um, um, <laughs> I say that because first I have to ask you, how in the world are you balancing being a color analyst, hosting your own radio show, doing videography, behind the scenes stuff, photography? <laughs> how, how do you do it? <laughs> Yeah, I don't really know. I don't even know how to answer. It's almost like a, you know, a step by step deal. You know, you just one <laughs> foot in front of the other and That's keep right. your head on the swivel for when <laughs> something pops up. Um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, there's a lot going on and and of course, you know, you saw the release today too, um, you know, moving over there and kind of taking on the GM role at at the new Hale State Plus. It's going to be a really cool thing. State fans are really had never seen anything like what's what that's going to be and that's got a fall launch uh, attached to it so we've been working like crazy already <clears throat> for a while now um behind the scenes and, and getting stuff ready for that so yeah um it just requires being flexible that's the thing for me is um i've had a lot of days where i did my radio show for two hours live from start well because i was there doing other stuff and i plugged my headphones into my phone and 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 that's how I did the show that day, you know. And uh, so it's a little bit of audibling at the line of scrimmage, just kind of making sure that stuff that needs to get done gets done. You know, it's certainly not – I certainly have not chosen a life uh, or occupation or lifestyle where things are cut and dry, where it's, you know, you're in the office at a certain time, you're a lunch break at a certain time, and then you're in the car at a certain time. And I certainly have not gone down that path for sure. Well, that's awesome. And that leads me to our next question I wanted to ask you about, because uh, if you keep up with Mississippi State sports, you've seen the release of the Hale State Plus thing today. And behind the scenes, I've been seeing your Facebook post, Twitter post of those videos, which are so neat. And it really is something that Mississippi State fans have never seen before. And I'm super intrigued. Fill us in a little more about behind the scenes in Hale State Plus. Well, yeah, um, this is a content platform uh, kind of centered around video, but there will be audio elements, uh, some podcast things uh, also that is a it, it's this isn't I hope that people understand this. This isn't something where there will be, let's say, a new video every week. This is something where there's going to be new stuff, multiple new pieces of content every day. Um, it is a place, it will be a place where, uh, a member, you know, a subscriber will, will go and, and see behind the scenes content, all access content, um, with every team on campus, uh, multiple coaches, multiple athletes on campus. <clears throat> sure. There will be some game coverage, obviously that kind of stuff. But this is going to be a storytelling platform that we've really never had before. And, you know, my name is there and people kind of know me because I've been associated and been connected to state for a long time. But there's actually more than just one person working on this. We, you know, a crew of people that's growing. Um, and so this is a team effort. It's a pretty big effort and undertaking. And the company that Mississippi State is partnering with that I am working for is called Sport and Story. Um, and they've partnered with other schools and, and are partnering with other schools to launch these platforms. And it's a really neat thing. I the, the biggest thing about it, I'm just so excited for our fan base to kind of get what we've always wanted. And that is we're not talking about a game replay um, after it happened. We're talking about something that's in depth on multiple levels uh all the time year round it's really going to be a neat thing that's awesome i can't wait um uh, this can kind of segue us into some mississippi state football questions for this season um i <laughs> my my dad my uncle my parents my friends are like the reason i'm a mississippi state fan i i grew up came home from the hospital mississippi state jersey when i was born like it was kind of <laughs> like <laughs> destined to be uh but yeah. i i sent out uh questions to all them saying hey I, I get the pleasure of interviewing matt wyatt this afternoon send in some questions because uh 
he'll be able to, I'll, I'll have him for a few minutes. So let, let's, let's send him in your best questions. And so these are, these are questions from all around. Uh, I also host this show with my, my buddy Addison and Addison wasn't able to join us today. So he sent okay. a few of his questions too, but uh, let's start with an easy one. Cause we answered this last week. We launched our show last week and uh, we asked the first question that everybody wants to know. What do you, what's your record prediction this year for the 22 Mississippi State team? Yeah, a record prediction. It's really a tough one to nail it down um, because the schedule is really tough. You know, you if if the ball bounces wrong in just a couple of times, you know, State could could be a better team this year and have the same record they had a year ago, sitting there at about seven wins, you know. But um, – yeah, I, I'm looking at somewhere. I, I think that with the schedule and with where they are in their maturity, and if people stay healthy, I mean, you can knock on the door of those nine wins. Um, it can be done. If I were to settle, I might settle around eight, and then people go, well, which eight is it? I just know that we've seen you've got two years of this team under Mike Leach, you know, in the, in, in the queue there, and you've seen road wins. That's one thing that we've seen, you know, first year you saw a win at LSU. Last year they go to Auburn. They go to A&M. You got road wins. And generally when you look at a schedule, you look at these road games in the SEC, and you don't necessarily chalk them up as wins. Well, let's just say it like it is. If this team doesn't go win a key road game, it'll be the first time under Leach they haven't done it. And that's what they did it with younger, with a younger team. Freshman and sophomore in offense this year, you're all – junior seniors pretty much everywhere. So I I just think do you keep your quarterback healthy and the in the right couple of players on defense, they're they're gonna have some fun this year. Is that eight wins? Is it nine? Some of that's gonna depend on the health, but they got a chance to do that this year, I think. Okay, so a question I also asked my dad yesterday was what like does your mindset change of the season if we go to Death Valley and win our first SEC game of the season? Yeah, I, you know, does it change? For me, I don't think it would necessarily change my mindset of it that much because I could very easy, I could see State winning it. You know, of course, it's on the road at LSU. It's going to be their first SEC game, Brian Kelly's first SEC game to coach. They're going to have it circled. They're going to know what you did. The last time you went down there, you put up 600 yards and kind of embarrassed them, you know, this whole thing. So they're going to have it circled. I mean, you could see LSU winning it, but you could see State winning it too. Um, so I don't know that it would necessarily change a whole lot for me, but but it is a swing game. We, we had that question on my show at one point, and it was somebody asked, you know, what are the swing games for you? And I said, well, I can't even get out of the first month of the season without saying this one and that one, because, you know, LSU, if you are 2-0 and and you go there and win, then it just opens up all these possibilities, you know, um, it, in terms of what that record can be, because now you've picked up a road win to start your conference schedule. You start adjusting that, and yeah. So, But, but the other thing is, too, like we want to see LSU first. We, they're one of those that, it's natural. We look at the name on the side of the helmet and we throw a certain amount of credibility at it. And, but we really need to see them play first, see what they're going to look like this year. <laughs> yeah. Talk about all of the swing games that you could point out <laughs> on that schedule. That's that is right. absurd. But it really um, is. You, you talked about keeping that quarterback healthy all season long. If, if we're able to keep Rogers healthy, I think that's huge, but mm-hmm. um, now that we've just got a commitment from Chris Parsons and we're looking, looking at next year's quarterback room. Um, I've heard people say this. I've said it. I wanted to get your opinion. Is this the best quarterback room, best quarterback group that you've seen in a really long time, if ever at Mississippi state? Yeah. I mean, it is. Um you know, at least in terms of identifying some pretty highly recruited players and going and signing them, a bunch of them, right? I mean, because, you know, I mean, looking back, hindsight, we know everybody's accomplishments, so we could go back to our quarterback room in the late 90s. You know, 99, you had Wayne Madkin, who for a long time became the school's leading all-time passer. I was a senior backup, but you had Kevin Fant in the same room, you know, who – that was a pretty good room, and 
then um but then you go to the room that had Dak and Nick Fitzgerald in the same quarterback room there for a couple of years. You know, those guys are way up there on the all-time SEC charts, both of them. Okay, so in terms of production, we can look back. This one is, you know, these guys, these collection of guys who were highly recruited, who had lots of options, who have lots of stars by their name when you look at recruiting services. They identified them, went and have signed them. I don't know that you've ever had a time where you had that many four-star type quarterbacks where they just went, okay, Texas, Texas, Tennessee, sign, 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 bring them in. I, I don't know that you've ever had one of those, honestly, at State. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I get excited thinking about uh, the future, but you're right. Just looking back production-wise, it's mm-hmm. it's hard to be able to tell what those guys are going to do eventually, and the transfer, transfer portal throws a whole That's loop right. into everything. But – uh, coming back to this season, we talk a lot about an offensive player that could be a standout this season because there's going to be room for somebody to stand out besides Will Rogers, obviously. But um, who who do you see on the defensive side of the ball that could be that standout player this year? Oh, that's a great question. Standout player on the defensive side of the ball. It could be Jordan Davis, you know, who's back from injury. He's just – it was such a shame last year because he was really set up to go in there and maybe be your best pass rusher last year. Seems to me to be back full speed. He looks good in practice, you know, so he he could be one, be a candidate. I also think a guy like Crumity on a defensive front who they move him in and out, you know, depending on the the opponent and the scheme, he could be another one. Um, That's two really good options right there. i tell you another is – uh, DeCameron Richardson, the, the corner opposite of uh, Forbes, we kind of know what Forbes is. Long, tall, plays the ball in the air, great. Every time an NFL scout comes to practice, they eventually want to go watch Forbes. You know, um, he's really good. But, you know, you stand next to him. DeCameron Richardson is a long player. He's probably taller and longer than people realize. You look at him on the field because he's matched up with some 6'5 receiver. But he's a long, tall athlete who has kind of taken a step and, You know, he could be another one, um, really, because I think he's a a good player with a high ceiling. Yeah, you mentioned a a bunch of those different position groups, um, and and we can bring in the offensive side too here. But uh, a lot of people will say that offensive line may be our least amount of depth this year. And I wonder if they're just saying that because we lost a first-round pick but where would where would you point – what position group would you point to if someone asked you, where's the least amount of depth on this Mississippi State team? Yeah. Um, you know, I probably would go to areas. I probably would say or, – or two or three. Defensively, linebacker, they're really good on that front line. And depending on who you put on the field and what package, you know, Bookie Watson, Jet Johnson, uh, Tyrus Wheat, um, you know, that group, if they're upright and healthy, you, you're good. But, you know, if you lose one or two, you start getting your depth. you got young players. John Lewis is a young linebacker I really like. He's just got to get game experience, you know, that sort of thing. Page, Deshaun Page, he's having a really good fall. Big, long athlete, can fly, you know, but you got to get him in some games. It's one thing to do it in practice. It's another thing to do it in Death Valley and Baton Rouge, you know. So we got to see all that stuff happen. Um offensively yeah offensive line i mean you you got right now as of today august the 18th you've got five or six that they're confident these guys can play we just got to make sure we got them in the right plug and play spot but you really need eight okay so you're still trying to find those two to three more and get them you know coached up and developed to where now somebody rolls an ankle you can run right in there we don't lose anything the, the good news is they're really veteran, though, on the offensive line. That whole group, man, it's a bunch of older guys, a sixth year at center, a bunch of, you know, fifth years at, at, at Nick Jones and uh, Smith, Cole Smith at backup guard. Really the only young guy at all in the, in the whole mix of the, the, the initial rotation of the offensive line is Albert Reese, who he may be the best one in the group so that kind of works out so i i don't necessarily have the offensive line concern that some people have and and they they do have a long way to go and are working their tails off 
I wouldn't be surprised if you saw some different combinations maybe in the first couple of games and then it gets settled by the time you go to Baton Rouge. Yeah, for sure. Um, you mentioned that talent, even when you're talking about uh, our, our, our young guys up front and then even talking about our record. Uh, the first question I asked you, there's there's talent everywhere and there's older guys and Leach went on the road and won with the younger guys. Mm -hmm. Um as a Mississippi State fan, and this question comes from my uncle, longtime Mississippi State fan. He's he's seen the worst of the worst happen where a field goal goes through and then gets blown back out. <laughs> but he asked, should we be optimistic this season since we've got some of the best talent we've ever seen in Mississippi State history? Yeah, you're going to have some moments this year. You know, it's like you asked me about the final record. I don't know. Um you also have some games where you're not supposed to win them. You know, that's where we are in college football. A team like Alabama and Georgia, Georgia rotates on. The way they've recruited, how they've recruited over the last, you know, four or five years in this weird structure of college football is there's this just – there's a gigantic gap in overall talent through the 85 on some of these college football teams versus everybody else. You know, and so – you. You pull off that upset, it's great. But this is what I know. The air raid, the Mike Leach teams, the way they coach it, paired with the defense that's loaded, they're going to give you some moments this year. We don't know exactly what they are. Is it, you know, upsetting a Texas A&M who's going to be highly ranked when they come to start role? Is it going and scaring the death to scaring Alabama to death for the first time in forever in Tuscaloosa? Is that even possible? You know those kinds of things you're going to get arkansas at home they'll probably be ranked you know um an egg bowl deal is leach going to win his first egg bowl i just know that with a good team and in a first time to have an experienced team they're going to give you some moments it's just going to happen this year it's a matter of who and when i probably should have asked you that question last about our football team because i feel like listeners will be really excited after hearing what you just said but i totally agree i mean there were there were moments last year of the second half of that auburn game will be something that i will never forget like that that mm -hmm. will go in the history books and i know it's recent on our minds right now but man that was epic <laughs> it really was i've never seen anything quite like it i've seen comebacks been a part of some but not where you, you get dominated, not just beaten, but dominated for two quarters, and you're down 25 points, and then not only come back, but you flip the switch, and you dominate them for the last two quarters, you know, and score 40-something points. I just – I don't know that I've ever seen a game quite like that one. That was a whole lot of fun. But there were a lot of games last year that weren't fun, and a lot of that was due to um, our field goal kicking. Um, and so that's that's my last question concerning this year's team. Mm -hmm. Is is there hope as you're sitting out there watching practice? Is is there hope that we make field goals, especially inside the 40, inside the 30, like the ones that should have been makes last year? It, do, are you seeing something out there at practice that we should be excited for? Yeah, yeah. There's going to be some consistency there, whoever comes out of that competition. Uh, there will be, you know, and – I know some people have seen numbers from scrimmages and stuff, but uh, you also have to consider that, yes, there's new guys with ability and stuff, but it, it's also a kicker who's dealing with a holder he's never worked with. It's a holder who's dealing with a snapper that he's never worked with, a snapper who's dealing with a holder that he's never worked with. You know, you're, you're working through all that in the early part of camp, and there's enough talent and competition there that you know, you'll have some consistency uh, this year. In, in fact, you know, you look at the numbers from a year ago, it'd hard, be hard to be worse. Um, so you'll, you'll have a little more consistency there. And that's, that's really important for sure. <laughs> yeah, my uncle responded after he sent that text to me and said, just tell him to please say yes, even if he really doesn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speak it like the Bible says, speak unto us smooth things. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, we Absolutely. want to hear smooth things. I love it. Well, hey, I want to hit on some uh, just some things going on in, in your crazy life right now. Um, okay. But we'd, we'd, we want to hear the thoughts on working alongside Neil Price. I know that's uh, what five or six years in the making now, mm -hmm. or if not longer. Um, yeah. But uh, that, that think we got to ask the question of 
if the opportunity ever arises, would you ever consider in going into that role of play by play? Oh, uh, I don't know about that, honestly, <laughs> uh, because yeah, play by play is so much of a different job. Um, and, uh, then color, it's a harder job, I think, you know, for, for most people, and it would be for me, it'd be a harder job. Color is not a hard job. It's a fun job. And because I, I can see plays happen and I know what's going on and I'm confident, you know, in delivering that to the fan base. So therefore it's fun. It's not so much like work doing play by play would be much more like work. And I think that, you know, people like Neil, they're, they're not only born with maybe the mindset to do it, but they do also have the voice and can one that will resonate with the fan base. I don't know that the Lord necessarily blessed me with that. So I kind of feel like that would not be a role for me, uh, play by play. I, I would, I would be interested in staying in the color chair and that's, that's, that's basically how I feel about it. That's awesome. Uh, I do love listening to you and Neil on Saturdays, man. It's, it's fun. I'm, I'm over in Dallas, Texas right now. And yeah. you know, whenever I get the opportunity to turn you guys on, even on the the live stream through hell state plus it's, it's, it's awesome to get to hear you guys. So well, I appreciate it. An that. amazing job. Well, we work well together and we're friends and, and, um, uh, yeah, we, we got a good team with Jay on the sideline. We just kind of have a good makeup. And Neil Neil is sort of the QB of the team. He's just – he runs a show. He's really good, you know. He does a great job. Okay, so it's had to have been a blast covering Mike Leach for the last couple of years going into his third season. Um, but do you have a time or a moment that you just could not help but bust out laughing to whatever this guy said in the middle of a press conference or an yeah. interview or whatever. That's a good question. Uh, because I, I generally haven't gone to press conferences. Um, you know, that I, I, I hadn't had a need to go to the weekly ones and then post game, I'm not really in a position to go, but I will tell you, yes, I've had some moments where we do that. Now, this year at SEC Media Days was one of those where he was on with Feinbaum. And, you know, pretty pretty soon in that interview, he, he, he you know, Feinbaum made some comment about he should go down to with him to Key West to do a radio show. And Mike Lee said, yeah, it'd be fun, but your listeners wouldn't enjoy it because it wouldn't be all about Alabama and Auburn. You know, so he just can't – this is live on the show. He just busted in with that, you know, and then – some of the other stuff so so he'll come up with some real zingers uh, from time to time he's the most the blunt coach i've ever heard speak <laughs> he really is he just he i don't think i described it one time as you know really in a positive way he's not cynical he's not he doesn't have a like a a mean bone in his body it seems like you know in dealing with people he likes talking to people talk to anybody anytime um whenever he's around fans, if they've got, if, if media has to get him somewhere else, they have to encourage him. Come on, you know, come on. Cause he'll just stand around and talk. You know, he's very, very different down to earth in that regard. But the way I described it before is I kind of feel like sometimes Mike, it's not that not only is he not concerned at all with what anybody else thinks of him, he's really not even aware of it. What anybody else thinks of him. He's just his own guy. He's going to, say and do what he wants to do and and roll with it and i think what happens with him is he's been coaching long enough and he's got outside interests and he's been coaching so long that a lot of the x's and o's and football talk sometimes maybe it's just so secondhand that it's not that interesting to him anymore <laughs> if he's not actually coaching so he enjoys the occasional question that's off the beaten path you know so yeah. uh, but he is a lot of fun to cover for sure I can't imagine, but I I love I will never forget him talking about nerd clusters and the candy <laughs> during Halloween. <laughs> I know. That was great. That was amazing. But okay, this one's off the wall. Um, and I feel like I know what your answer is gonna be. But how do you balance your uh I, I sh maybe I should word it as your your the way that you dislike Ole Miss and having a having married a wife that graduated from Ole Miss. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of compromise, you know, in that over the the years, we've been married uh, 14 years where I've, I've had to go to Oxford some, you know, I didn't necessarily want to. 
Um, but I've had to do that. And, and then, you know, the games, I think one thing that really helps is in terms of the results of the games that have happened, you know, I'm working the game, so I don't necessarily get as emotional about it. It's more like it's a, it's a job day sort of thing, which helps her when state wins. And so I'm not obnoxious, you know, whatever. And she is one who, she doesn't get too emotional about football, you know. She's not a, I mean, she knows the results, it's fine or whatever, but she's really, it, it's not near the top of her priority list, let's put it that way, you know, what happens in the ball games, And so that, that has helped us in that neither of us are really that emotional about it for different reasons. Um, but we do have a good time with it from time to time, but it's been pretty tame for the most part. That's awesome. Uh, we originally worded that question as how do you balance a hate for Ole Miss and a love for your wife? But <laughs> yeah. we, we knew you would just say that you don't hate Ole Miss. Um, <laughs> and my response, if you were going to say that, was going to be, I felt like you hated them whenever Bo Wallace fumbled in the end zone. And <laughs> yeah, that was such a great moment, you know, at the end it of that awesome. ball game. And I kind of blurted it out, fumble and then ball game. I yelled them both, which you shouldn't do if you're – color guy i would not recommend you just blurt things out but sometimes you can't help it you know well i can tell you every mississippi state fan was excited whenever you did so that was <laughs> awesome. um, okay last question and this comes from actually uh my my cousin and he's a big fisherman and we know that you at least used to have a big love for bass fishing and yeah he wants to know what would be your go-to lake in mississippi if you want to you know you got to catch something that day Ooh, what a question. <laughs> Go to lake, huh? I would probably have to say, I'd probably say Pickwick. And it's barely in Mississippi, you know, like it's extreme northeast Mississippi. But I would just say, yeah, because it's such a big, you know, wide open body of water. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, fast moving river when they open it up and so you get current and when that water moves you can be bass fishing and you catch a drum you know you can catch a you can catch something just just about any time uh, uh whether you're targeting that or not so i would probably and it's got everything you know if you want to fish open water and big ledges and use your depth finder and humps out in the middle of nowhere you know you can do that you can get up in sloughs and fish rock banks. You can go up in boat docks. And so Pickwick's got a little bit of everything. That's what I would go with. That's awesome. He'll be pumped to hear that. So <laughs> thank you so much, Matt, for uh, yeah. joining us. I know it was a quick interview, but seriously, thank you for taking time out of your day to come join us on the show. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.